नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस सेकेंड लेक्चर ऑन द इवेल्युएशन मेथड्स ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी एज यू वुड बी अवेयर इन द फर्स्ट लेक्चर वी टॉक्ट अबाउट इवेल्युएटिव मेथड्स वी ऑल्सो लुकड एट द एडवांटेजेस एंड डिसएडवांटेजेस ऑफ दीज इवेल्युएटिव मेथड्स एंड फर्दर वी लुकड एट यूजर सेंटर्ड डिजाइन हाउ ब्रिंगिंग इन यूजर्स एट एवरी स्टेप ऑफ द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ अ प्रोडक्ट helps in making a better product with high performance rates and lower error rates next we discussed the interview technique of collecting data from users who are participants in the user centered design today's lecture will be focused on some more methods of collecting data for the user centered design we'll also focus on task analysis and cognitive task analysis and further we we'll look at methods of design evaluation so let's begin so question is in interviews there is a one to one interaction between an interviewer and a respondent and interviews tend to collect a lot of data there are various forms of interviews but interviews are expensive and also interviews sometime result in data which may mean a lot but it is very varied making meaning out of the data itself becomes a problem and collecting large number of data from an interview is another problem the solution to all this is the use of questionnaire questionnaires are equivalent to surveys and these are a format of collecting data from users you would have seen a number of questions around you it could be a website survey containing some questions relating to the performance and the designer website at other times in a supermarket you would have got a questionnaire concerning the layout of the market or certain products which are available in the market or there could be questionnaires which you would get on a flight where specific questions are asked regarding the flights hostess the feeling within the flights and your experience and satisfaction in taking a flight so in all questionnaires consist of list of questions to which people have to provide answers so questionnaires are referred as surveys and it's another mean of gathering user requirements and user data as i just explained to you most questionnaires are in a written format sometimes you might find questionnaires which are spelled out but the nature of the auditory system suggests that information in the audition is transitory in nature and so holding up a lot of information is not possible so the verbal form of a questionnaire is not a success mostly you will find a written format of questionnaire now as i was explaining to you how interviews lack the ability to collect a lot of data questionnaire surpasses interview in this aspect because this questionnaires can be distributed to a lot of people in very less time and a lot of data can be collected so when data is of value the use of tool for collecting data should be a questionnaire another important feature of a questionnaire is that it avoids demand characteristics so what are demand characteristics there are certain features within the environment of the respondent or the operator which gives him a subtle hint as to what he should do so somebody is taking some kind of response from you and his unintentional nods and smiles or ex facial expressions provide you enough information as to what you should be doing in that situation meaning which these kind of environmental hints help the users provide a certain kind of response this is only possible in an interview when you have a one to one interaction with the interviewer 
but when you are giving a questionnaire you don't have the interviewer or the question maker in front of you and so question is don't suffer from the problem of demand characteristics so if you believe that experimenter bias or demand characteristics may be a reason that can affect your research the use of questionnaire would be a good option now questionnaires are not easy to design the simple reason being that most questionnaires represent the question maker in front of the person who is answering and so a lot of thought has to go into creating a questionnaire questionnaires are psychometrically valid instruments which are complex and the development of require it requires a number of iteration this means that whenever you are designing questions for a questionnaire you should assess a high validity and high reliability of the questionnaire and on these basis the questions within a questionnaire should be selected there are number of other features that should be considered while making a questionnaire and we'll look at that as we go about this lecture now the reason for maintaining psychometric validity in a questionnaire comes from the fact that different people may interpret the same question differently let's say there is a question which defines what is life satisfaction so for some people who are older in age life satisfaction is about being in peace they have earned a lot they have had a happy life and fulfilling too so their life satisfaction is more about peace on the other hand the same life satisfaction for a 20 to 30 age group person would be acquiring more money to buy new things because these newer things and more money give them satisfaction so the same life satisfaction for different group of people would be different and so while creating a questionnaire these issues should be kept in mind that is the reason why reliability and validity should be maintained at optimal levels while designing questions for a questionnaire now the development of a questionnaire generally starts with first assessing and determining what is it that i am going to study whether it is performance that i am going to study whether it is satisfaction that i am going to study or whether it is some other psychological property that i am going to study once you have that field or that construct clear in mind that you want to study you can move to the next step of creating a questionnaire now as i described the first step in creating a question is to understand what construct you are going to study the next step would be to use what kind of measures of it so i am understanding happiness through a questionnaire happiness is a construct and it may differ from people to people so while making a happiness questionnaire the person making a questionnaire should be certain as to what features of happiness should i be including whether happiness is related to certain personality dynamics whether happiness is related to only behavioral happiness or transcendental experiences or some other means so i should have certain parameters on which happiness is defined 
Now, where to get these parameters? You have to look at research. Now, while defining happiness, most researchers will lay out a operationalization of happiness and when they operationalize, they will give some kind of a definition as to what happiness means according to them. If enough time is spent, we would come to know what are those factors which define happiness and we can then use those factors in our questionnaire to measure happiness. So, this is how the beginning of a questionnaire starts. Questionnaires can have varied type of questions. Two important type of questions that can be used within a questionnaire are open ended and close ended questions. Open ended questions could be like define how satisfied you feel after traveling to this airline. Now, in this kind of a question you can put in any answer that you want related to your experience. On the other hand, if I do not want you to go tangential and if I want a quick response in terms of certain fixed values, I may give a close ended question as in rate on a scale of 1 to 5, how do you feel about the satisfaction while you travel through this airline or I could put you multiple choice questions, yes no questions where you have to tick an answer. So, then most questionnaires can have both open ended and close ended questions. Now, the close ended questions can be forced choice resp response type questions. These are multiple choice questions. There are four options given for a question. One or maybe more than one answers are valid and other answers are distractors and the job of the operator or the user here is to find the correct solution. Recognition is the type of memory that is used in solving this kind of questions. We can have two alternative force choice questions where user satisfaction has to be rated in terms of yes and no. So, you have to either say yes or no. We could have a Likert type scale where a benchmark is set as in define your satisfaction about traveling in this plane on a scale of 1 to 5 and 0 being not satisfied at all and 5 being extremely satisfied. This kind of answers require people to evaluate the uh, satisfaction of traveling on a scale and then circle a value and provide a response. There are ranking scales where you can provide a rank to your response as in how high or low do you feel satisfaction is in your travel and so you can rank among a number of alternatives the alternative of interest. Then there are free form responses that you can use in a questionnaire more or less like a open ended question. But in an open ended question some kind of guide is given as to what has to be written. In free form responses people can write in any way they like responses to a question. Now, while designing a questionnaire there are three things one should be careful about. The first thing is loaded questions. People while making a questionnaire should not make a loaded question. What is a loaded question? A loaded question is the one where some kind of hint is given so that the hint refers to someone as something. Loaded here means that you are providing some kind of weight 
or some kind of clue as to how you should be perceiving answers. So, examples are do you think it is fair that these greedy owners of this company vote themselves pay raises? Now, if you look very carefully, the question has the term greedy owners and by default it is suggesting that the owners of the company are greedy. This is a weight which is attached to the owner and this will create a bias on the part of the user because the user will start thinking in terms of greedy owners. We should also not have leading questions in a questionnaire. So, a leading question is a question which implies a sense as to what somebody should be doing and what somebody should not do. It tells you the way you should answer a question. Whereas, loaded questions give you some clue about what the question means. Leading questions tell you what you should be doing in a particular situation or how you should be thinking in terms of answering a question. And again here example is you do not think the owners of this company are crooks do you because the question suggests that the owners of the company are actually crooks and so you start that thinking along those lines. There is another kind of questions to avoid and that is called the double barrel question. A double barrel question is a question where there are two questions within one question. So, people really do not know which question to give priority to or how to answer these question in the same context. An example that I have here says that do you think high school students should be allowed to drive to school and to have part time jobs. Now, when providing an answer to this question, users will get confused as to what should they answer, which question should they answer and even if they answer both the questions at the same time, how should they put their responses. So, it satisfies both the terms which are used in this question. How should they provide an answer which satisfied allowing driving to students and also part time jobs. So, these kind of questions should best be avoided in creating a questionnaire. Close ended items in a questionnaire are fixed responses. And for fixed responses, a benchmark always have to be set. If you do not provide a benchmark, if you do not provide an internal scale on which to rate your answers, it becomes very difficult for the users to provide an answer. So, if you do not say on what scale are you going to rate the satisfaction, whether it is a one directional scale or a two directional scale, a one directional scale starts with good and then goes to excellent. A two directional scale goes with not at all and then on the other end it is extreme with neutral being in middle. Now, so you have to provide these kind of benchmarks or this kind of ratings on which answer should be provided simply for the reason that people do not have to think too much or do not get tangential in providing the responses. So, I have given an example here using a rating scale benchmarks could be 1 becomes horrible and 5 become fantastic. So, I am going from extremely negative to extremely positive and this kind of a benchmark can be used. One another feature that is of use in designing questionnaires is the order of questions. Sometimes questions are made in such a way that one question inevitably influences other question. There could be questions the response of which could be influencing other questions. This has to be thought beforehand. If one specific question can influence responses of another general question its arrangement has to be checked because if one question somehow provides answer to the other question 
and if it is a paper pencil test users can go back to the first question and correct their responses to make both questions in line so the type of question that you are putting in should also be checked before making a questionnaire now if you remember sampling techniques from the second section that we did in this course we defined random sampling and stratified sampling along with other sampling this also has an effect on making a questionnaire whether it is for a specific person or specific strata that you are making a question or whether it is for the population in general that you are making a questionnaire that will define how questions are to be made one important point that people should follow in making a questionnaire is that the sample that you are collecting who you believe will take this question and give an answer to should be representing the population so i make a questionnaire to study how effective a product is now i cannot study everyone who has used this product so what i do is i take a sample while taking the sample i should be very careful to take every kind of people who use this product and that is a representative sample so while making question this is of importance now questionnaires are not all that good there are a number of disadvantages of questionnaires one possible disadvantage of a questionnaire is a inability to interact with respondent since you are not able to be present when a question is being put in front of the respondent there is very less chance that you can explain additional information related to the question and so there is high chance that the questions could be misinterpreted this is one disadvantage of a questionnaire another disadvantage of questionnaires are the poor response rate most people don't take questionnaires very seriously and they don't feel like submitting back a questionnaire and so often in our research too we find that the number of respondents sending back the questionnaire is very low and so this drop in the number of respondents is another problem with a questionnaire there is another way to collect data and that is called a focus group now in a focus group a small people a small group of people are brought in a room this group of people share some commonalities and this group of people becomes the representative population discussions are held with these people and since these people are representing the target population who will be using the modified design or the new software that you are designing we try to gather as much information as possible from this small group of people remember in interview we talked about focus groups if there are multiple respondents and one interviewer if there are multiple interviewer and one respondents or there are multiple respondents and multiple interviewer this kind of setup is called a focus group so this is what the focus group is all about now focus groups are very focused in the sense that they provide very specific answers and there are various ways of creating a focus group let's start looking at what focus groups are and how to make a focus group so interview with a small group of people typically 6 to 8 who have something in common are brought together into a usability lab so assuming that i have made a new change in my software people have been writing saying that there is a step in the software which is confusing them and taking their feedback i make some modifications how do i know these modifications really work the how part will be dealt later when we look at task analysis and design evaluation but the people who will provide answers are the focus group so what i'll do is i'll look at people who use this software i'll call them up make them sit in a usability lab give them the 
software to use and note the responses. Later on I will discuss with them their experiences and their thinking, their mental models of this software and this change that I have done in the software and based on that I will be ready to do a task analysis. So, a facilitator conducts a guided discussion with a group using interview techniques and different question types. In a focus group there is one interviewer who is called a facilitator and a number of people who are the part of this focus group. There is a one to one discussion between the facilitator and the group and by using interviews and other specific questions data is gathered from this small group of people. Now, just by being a smaller group and a much diverse environment, the data that you tend to get from a focus group is generally much better than an interview. Since you are using people who use that software or who use that product and you are interviewing them in small numbers, you stand a high chance to get good responses, constructive responses and informative responses from this group of people. The next kind of technique for data collection is very similar to the focus group, but there are some major deviations. This kind of data collection technique is called a contextual inquiry. What happened in a contextual inquiry is people in their natural environment in the job that they are doing, they are observed and records are made out of it. There also is a discussion with this group of people and both the observation data and the data that comes out of discussion is clubbed together to get a rich form of response. So, method of gathering data where user requirements are gathered by observing a person in his or her own environment. One benefit of a contextual inquiry is that since people are in their own environment, they are more likely to do natural responses, those responses that they generally do while doing a job. In a focus group, it is an artificial situation and so people may tend to display the best behavior, but in a contextual inquiry, people are in their environment and they are being observed and so all those errors, all those shortcuts that people tend to make while making a response or interacting with a product can be understood. What do researchers do in a contextual inquiry? They observe shadow the person and through this observing and shadowing, they take notes. What are these notes concerned about? The notes that researchers collect from looking at people in their natural environment is about the workflow. How should a job be done? what are the steps that somebody is following for completing a job, what are the tasks of the user, what are the steps and what are the tasks that the user is doing for completing a particular assignment. Let us say writing an email, a number of tasks has to be done, you have to log in, then you have to open up the particular email client find out where the compose button is, type in a name, type in an address, then put a subject line, write the body, check it, send it and this is how you compose. So, there are a number of tasks which are associated. These tasks are noted by the researcher 
while he is observing the people in his context. Environment is also noticed. Sometimes it is the environment which is creating a problem. And so, by looking at what is the environment around people who are doing a job, a lot of information can be gained. Is the environment supportive? Is the environment hindering the performance? High temperatures, inefficient lighting, noisy environments, all of them can be leading to incorrect or half-hearted responses by the user. So, noting the environment in which the user is performing a job as a major role to play in providing data for doing task analysis and measuring design changes. And the last step that researchers do is they interact with others. How users interact with other users? How the in users of a particular job interact with other senior management people, interact with the system. That kind of data is also collected and this kind of data provides some clue as to what is happening and what should be the natural flow of task and what the user is doing. By looking at these possible error points can be noted and then they can be tackled. Now, this provides a more accurate representation of a person's job than a questionnaire or interview, but is more time consuming. So, by doing contextual inquiry, you will get high quality rich data, but it takes a lot of time because you have to be with that person for a longer period of time, do observations, do discussions. In an interview or a questionnaire, it is a one shot thing. Do an interview, it is some time taking, but then it is over. Questionnaire is much easier, put a question and the person answers. And so, on one hand, contextual inquiry is a data rich form of investigation, but it loses its advantage in terms of time and cost effectiveness. So, we looked at how to collect data. The next step is to do a task analysis. Remember the idea behind this section. We are looking at how to evaluate designs, how to evaluate modifications and changes that are either new or that we are proposing for older systems. One possible test of this is task analysis. A task analysis will tell the developer or the research group behind a manufacturing unit as to what is the task and how is the task being actually performed and what are the points on which errors are created. By doing a thorough task analysis followed by a cognitive task analysis, developers and research groups will have an idea of the natural flow of a task, the thinking of people who are performing the task, the mental model that people are using in completing the task, the shortcuts that people are using in completing a task, a combination of information from all these points will help the developer in designing possible changes that could make the older design or a new product more efficient than a older product. So, beside user requirements through understanding of the task, a user does is critical to the design process. So, understanding user requirement and what is the actual user doing are both critical to the design of a new modified system or a new interface. Data collected will provide the researchers with the understanding of the task that users typically perform with the system. The data that you collect from either an interview or a contextual inquiry or a focus group will tell you what users normally do 
how they go about completing a task. Let us assume that there is someone working at a power generation plant. By doing a interview or focus group or contextual inquiry, the user will have some idea of how the task is done and this he can demonstrate to the researcher by doing the task. By looking at how the operator is working in a power plant, researchers who are brought in to modify systems, to modify design interfaces, they will come to know what is the natural sequence of performing job in a power plant and by collecting data, they will come to know what is the natural or what is the most preferred way of moving around a power plant by talking to them and the notes that they make while observation, the researchers will have those points which are creating problem in task execution and lowering the performance and they can address these error points in a future design modification. Task analysis exactly does this. Task analysis allows researcher to describe task in further detail. You can observe a worker in a power plant and you can find a mental model. But when you talk to these workers, you will come to know several new information which you cannot collect by observing and this is the benefit of a task analysis. How actually the task is performed and how it should be performed. The discrepancy between that is what you will come to know by doing a task analysis. Now, it involves all necessary actions for each step of the task as well as the cognitive processes necessary. Let us take the example of the power plant. Now, within that there are some natural steps. You have to start up the inflow of energy which will be used to run turbines. These turbines then will produce current which then will be transferred to a grid. Now, all these steps have to be done in sequential manner. By doing task analysis, you will come to know how users and operators within the power unit, how are they performing the job. Not only you will come to know the manner in which the jo job is done, you can also know what the user is thinking while doing a particular job. You will often find that what operators do is they create some kind of a mental shortcut. Although there is a prescribed way of doing things, most operators create shortcuts so that the job can be completed with little effort. Now, what was that thinking which have helped them in creating the shortcuts and which maybe can be used in a newer version of the design interface? Those kind of information can be gathered from cognitive task analysis or cognitive process analysis. So, task analysis is done using something called a hierarchical task analysis method and in a hierarchical task analysis methods, there are three parts. One, identification of goals as to what is to be achieved, identification of operations as to what has to be done to achieve the goal and identification of plans as to step by step procedure of doing operations to attaining the goal. So, hierarchical task analysis will provide you with what the goal is, which is what the operator does and want to accomplish. The operations, what actions are necessary to complete the task and plan how are the goals and operation executed. Let us again refer back to writing an email. Now, for writing an email, the goal is to send an email. The operation is to log in, find the compose button, provide the address, provide text and send. Plan is how do you log in, where do you search for the compose button, is there a shortcut to it, if there is then what all information should be provided in the compose box, the minimum information that is needed for sending an email which fields are necessary, where is the send button, all this information composes of the plan. So, this is how the goals, operations and plans of any job can be listed using 
hierarchical task analysis. Now, the output of a hierarchical task analysis is put in a tabular form or a diagram and this serves as a foundation of many additional methods designed to understand user and user system interaction. The goals, operations and plans are put in either a diagram form or in a tabular form and researchers or developers can refer to the table and find out those parts, those points that needs to improve. They will also find out those parts which create error in completing the job or which might be potentially hazardous, potential problems in finishing the job. Once they have developers have this information, they can then rethink in terms of what is the easiest way to write an email and that is the idea behind doing hierarchical task analysis to provide you easy information in tabular form about all steps of completing a job. Cognitive task analysis is a technique that identifies the cognitive and decision making aspects involved in each task and subtask. The thinking behind how you write an email. Now, the idea of an email comes from the snail mail or the letter that we used to write. People have some idea as to what is to be written in a mail, a postal mail. So, address is important, some kind of text is important, some kind of envelope or cover is important and a method of posting is important. The same mental model can be used for creating emails. Here also you have to have a body, you have to have an address, you have to go somewhere and post it and then you have to go to a place and collect the envelope. These kind of decisions and thoughts that subjects have about writing an email can be utilized in modifying how people write emails or use an email program. The thoughts, plans and decisions people have while they start writing an email can be listed and an improvement in, is done in these for creating better designs. Another fact and information that you can get from hierarchical task analysis is called human error identification. By doing task analysis, you will come to know where people are doing errors, what makes them do an error and what are the potential points at which errors can occur. Once you have these, you can come up with better designs which can do more robust error handling. So, techniques that identify potential sources of error at the task and subtask level. For example, in uh, my email writing, I can put a compose button at the very top of the email box because that is what most people come to in a email application. So, it should be the highlight. The send button could be put on the top. Generally, after finishing your email, you tend to review it back and if the send button is at the top, it becomes easier for you to notice it and send it and so these kind of changes can be done. If you put the send button somewhere else or if you manipulate with some other factors, hide the compose button or provide by yourself certain addresses, then that could lead to errors and so this can be studied and a modified and efficient email working system can be developed. After doing a task analysis and before collection of data, a user profile analysis is done. What is user profile analysis? 
when you are collecting data you should be sure of who you are using as your target group. User profile analysis is a detailed description of the critical characteristics of a user demographic. What people are you using for collecting the data either through an interview or a contextual inquiry or a focus group. The researcher should be aware of the gender, the age, domain experiences, technological experiences, education level, physical characteristics, cognitive capabilities and motivation. This will tell you who your users are and you will have a much better idea of who you are dealing with and that can help you in designing. Persons may be developed, personas may be developed from the user profile information. Once you know who the users are, you can create artificial personas. So, I come up with a new kind of product, a new kind of face cream. Who should I be selling it to? Now, face creams are very popular among certain group of people, certain age group and certain age group are prone to buying it, but they are not too interested. So, you can create personas of different age group of people as in what is their age, what is their education level, what is their uh, financial status, education level, motivation behind using the cream and create hypothetical people out of it and then try to make the product according to these personas. So, personas are hypothetical people that you create out of information that you get from the target user group. One method of analysis of data that is used in task analysis or design evaluation is card sorting. So, card sorting is a method used to interpret how people think about information. When I want to know people's mental model about a particular application or a particular job, I need to do a card sort. A card sort is helpful because it can take data from several different data collection methods and can give us a rich experience, a rich data set which provides enough information and quality information for modifications. Now, researchers present target users with a series of index card each containing the name of an object in piece of information. This activity also may be done electronically or using virtual cards. So, here target users are called in. When you have data, these data is grouped together in several categories and all these categories are given to this target users with certain index card. What the job of the user would be to club together those characteristics, those information which tend to be similar and using a card sorting, the developer will come to know the mental model of the user. It could be that the developer is thinking something else and the user is uh, thinking something else. By doing card sort, they will come to know how users categorize various features or various information which is provided by the different techniques of collecting data. Users are asked to group or categorize the cards in a way that make the most sense to them. It could be that the developer is thinking of all the information available in a different mental model, but the users may be thinking it in a different mental model and by using card sort, I will come to know where is the discrepancy between the thinking of the developer and the user and by creating a bridge between the mental models of the user and the developer, a more efficient design can be created. Card sorting results are generated for each user group to determine differences. The last section in this lecture is about design evaluation. So, we have information, we have studied the user, we have collected data using data methods and then we need also performed a task analysis. Based on that, we made some modification, but how well the modifications are can only be tested to something called design evaluation. So, designers create a product to meet users need.
However, it is still necessary to evaluate the designs one created. You need to test the design. Now, designers need to be evaluated when they are in the initial prototyping stage. If you do not do the design analysis at the very beginning, what will happen is you will end up with a product which is non-productive, which is not very efficient. So, if you use users at the very prototyping stage where the product is still in the bench, new modifications can be created and tested. So, that when the final use of the product or the final launch of the product is done, it does not has a number of problems or a number of simple problems. This allows developers to see where they may be design deficiencies early in the product life cycle. So, by de design evaluation, developers will come to know deficiencies. There are two ways of doing it. One is called the heuristic evaluation. It is based on a technique by jo Jacob Nielsen. Now, Jacob Nielsen designed and proposed a set of 10 usable heuristics which can be used to explain the major problems in machine interfaces. So, he gave a list of 10 different heuristics which different evaluators need to follow while evaluating a design interface and they have to report what errors do they find and where these errors are on what heuristics. Collect data from many evaluators and you will come to know which are the heuristic points or tests on which the design is failing. You can improve that and you will have a better design. So, conduct, to conduct a heuristic analysis, several evaluators and these evaluators are usability experts or subject matter experts. They are individually evaluated the application and judge how well the interface adheres to a predefined set of usability principle. Now, each evaluator generates a list of usable problems by principle. By looking at what a uh, task is, they evaluate this task on the 10 point scale or the 10 uh, heuristic tests which Nelson has proposed. They will list a problem and they list the problem in terms of which test it is failing. Once you have this data, you can go back to that test, see what it is measuring and make the changes. All data from all the evaluators are taken together and a summary sheet is prepared. Now, more than one evaluator is used generally 3 to 5 is the best practice and the number of evaluators that you should bring in a, in a heuristic analysis depends on cost benefit analysis. The cost being the time to plan that to conduct an evaluation, fixed and variable cost like salary, benefits is the usability problem that is discovered and the increased productivity. So, these are the cost and benefit and you have to maintain it in such a way that you have to find that sweet spot which decides how many people to call. Now, the advantage of using a heuristic analysis is they are efficient, they are low, low cost and quick for assessing usability. But the disadvantage is that it relies on experts opinion and not on the end user. So, end users are not brought in and so it is the experts who are giving their view. This can create problems because experts have a different mental model, different thinking of how a job is done and users have a different thinking. So, that is one disadvantage. Also, it is subjective because different experts would have different evaluations or different definitions of the same feature. These are the 10 different heuristics which are proposed by Nielsen. You can have a look at it and each evaluation has to be tested on these 10 markers or these 10 frames. The next part of design evaluation is usability testing. It is another method of doing design evaluation. In usability testing, an empirical method of measuring a product's ease of use. So, it is basically dependent on how easy a product is to use. People representing the target users are brought into the usability lab and asked to complete a series of tasks with a product. So, people, users who use a task are called in and they work with a product. 
the researchers observe what the user is doing they look at user satisfaction and performance data and they collect these and summarize this for a review one person at a time is allowed to work with one facilitator the job of the facilitator is to make sure that the user is doing the correct job but not guide him as to how the job should be done while doing a job the users are encouraged to think aloud as in describe a step by step how they are accomplishing the task during think aloud protocol participants say what they are thinking as they work through the task verbal comments are recorded by facilitators and cameras other measures like task success task to complete task number of steps to complete a task errors made on the task users perception of ease of use and appeal and overall user satisfaction in the product is also collected so those these are the data which is collected now one critical component of usability testing is task or scenario that are used as data from test because a test is as good as the task which is used so a number of scenarios can be created in which the same task is done and data collected from it one scenario should not be used for every user as different users have different environments so a number of scenarios are hypothetical scenarios are created and users are tested on this uh, different scenarios the human factor specialist develop task or scenarios that should represent a set of common activities users would attempt to do with the product and may be a direct result from a task analysis exercise another critical component of the us usability testing is the selection of users that serve as a participant as a as results can be generalized if users represent population if you have varied users if you have different kind of users which are not part of using your product they will never use your product then you will get incorrect data so you should always use those users which are going to use your product or which are involved with your product analysis of data is done generally 5 uh, to 10 people are put in a group and they uh, give the data the analysis is separately done for each individual it involves both subjective and objective data analysis and data analysis method that is using both the inferential and descriptive statistics task performance is often reflected by successes time on task and errors committed number of steps for each task to optimal number of steps each task should take is evaluated and this gives you an idea of how the task is done and what is the workflow of the task now these data are summarized with perceived difficulty perceived confidence for task completion satisfaction and preference rating and this is how the evaluation is done now there are various methods of doing usability testing specific measures to assess usability you have something called the system usability scale which is a 10 point item scale you, there is something called the mental workload the mwl and the nasa tlx another questionnaire which can uh, address usability uh, related concepts and physiological measures like heart rate galvanic skin response eye movements can also be used now there is a variation of the traditional usability testing a different form of usability testing we can use co participant usability testing where more than one users are under the same time also we can use something called remote usability testing where the facilitator and the user are in different locations and connected to technology and that is how usability testing can be done now in this lecture we not only looked at how task analysis is done we also looked at how questionnaires and focus group and contextual inquiry provide data for analysis we looked at heuristic evaluation and usability testing as a measure of design evaluation and all in all we understood how different methods of evaluation of designs and design modifications are done to make sure that the modified designs serve the purpose for which it was created and to improve the efficiency of these designs this is all for today from the mooks lab thank you and namaskar mm -hmm.